this session, I'm trying to remember it's not night, uh, is to just explain why I believe the Bible. Other people in the room may have other reasons, um, these are just mine. Um, there are two ways that this can work. This can work if you're thinking about whether the Bible is inspired or not. Um, at the moment, I would say I don't. it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not, whether you believe the Bible is true or not. Hopefully by the end, I just want to make you think about maybe it really is and change some of the things you might hear around at school or at college or at work or in the world. And secondly, if you already do believe, this is quite useful because um, some grandparents uh, have been discussing the Bible with their grandchildren and have found some difficulties in trying to uh, get them to think about the Bible being true because, as we'll see in a minute, most people think that God doesn't exist and the Bible is just a book of uh, stories. So hopefully it'll work for whichever category we fall in. So I'm going to begin with... What do people in the world then generally think about the Bible? And I guess one of the most popular people out there at the moment is a scientist called Richard Dawkins, who says this in his book, The God Delusion. He says, to be fair, much of the Bible is not systematically evil, but just plain weird. As you would expect of a chaotically cobbled together anthology of disjointed documents, composed, revised, translated, distorted and improved by hundreds of anonymous authors, editors and copyists, unknown to us, and mostly unknown to each other, spanning nine centuries. Now, I like that quote because that's the reason, one of the reasons why I believe the Bible is inspired. Not because it's chaotically cobbled together, but because it is a group of people who didn't know each other, some of them, over a period of 900 years, who write about different things. Someone might write poetry, another one history. And yet, when you put them all together, they fit brilliantly. But he says it's just chaotically ordered together. And I struggle with that, that if somebody wasn't organising it, then how come there is so much um, consistency through the Bible? Particularly some of these people couldn't have seen some of the things that they had been written before when they wrote. Isaac Asimov is uh, one of America's leading sci-fi writers, and a lot of people uh, respect him. And he says this about the Bible. Imagine the people who believe such things, that is people who believe in the Bible, and who are not ashamed to ignore totally all the patient findings of thinking minds through all the centuries since the Bible was written. And it is these ignorant people, the most uneducated, the most unimaginative, the most unthinking among us, who would make themselves the guides and leaders of us all, who would force their feeble and childish beliefs on us, who would invade our schools and libraries and homes. I personally resent it bitterly. Um, I actually resent bitterly what he says there, because he's basically saying that because I believe in the Bible, I am uneducated, unimaginative, unthinking, and got feeble and childish beliefs. For someone who makes up stories, that's quite good. So, so he's saying there that people who believe in the Bible ignore a lot of other things that have been done, patient findings of thinking minds. So clever people like Richard Dawkins... Um, Stephen Hawking uh, and people like that who are very very clever people and he says that people like me who believe in the Bible ignore what they say uh, and it's not just in science it's actually in literature even modern literature so if any of you read popular literature then one of those books you might read is The Lost Symbol by Dan Brown he of Da Vinci Code fame and in just as a, a throwaway line he says you can point to the alleged miracles of the Bible or any other religious text they're nothing but old stories fabricated by man and then exaggerated over time. So, a scientist, a sci-fi writer and a thriller writer all suggesting the Bible is just a group of things, stories, put together, cobbled together over time. Now, Stephen Fry is, I think still, the most popular person on Twitter. Uh, he has a massive following, people follow him all the time. And he doesn't believe in God, and he has a problem with people who do, and he has a problem with people who believe in the Bible or any other religious text. And he says this, I've always been extremely uncomfortable with the idea in any society that the belief is based on revealed truth. That's to say, a text like a Bible or a Quran, or whatever it is. It seems to me that the greatness of our culture, for all its incredible faults, is that we have grown up on the Greek ideal of discovering the truth, discovering by looking around us, by empirical experiment, but the culmination of the experience of generations of ancestors who have contributed to our some knowledge of the way the world works, and so on. So what Stephen Fry is saying, uh, and I'm gonna, we're going to do this in a minute, Stephen Fry says that really we should look at facts around us, 
look at science, look at nature, look at the world around us, and understand from that, his conclusion, that the Bible isn't inspired, that there isn't a God, it's just evolution. And he's saying, much like the earlier scientists, that we can write things down, we can prove things with theories and stuff, therefore, if we can't do that with the Bible, then we shouldn't listen to that, because the Bible's been proven wrong. Uh, Albert Einstein said this, he said, The word God is, for me, nothing more than the expression and production of human weaknesses. So, rude, uh, basically he's saying that we're weak if we believe in the Bible. It's a collection of honourable, but still primitive legends, which are nevertheless pretty childish. No interpretation... No matter how subtle can, for me, change this. Okay, so we might say, well, actually you would expect <coughs> scientists and, um, I, I guess, clever people to say the Bible's not inspired, it's just a collection. But what about religious people? Surely Christians who use the Bible would say something different. Well, this is what George Bersaglio says. He's the current Pope. He was talking about, there was a meeting of the Catholic Synod to discuss uh, gay priests and to discuss uh, female bishops. And he said this, One, a temptation to hostile inflexibility, that is, wanting to close oneself within the written word, the letter, the Bible, and not allowing oneself to be surprised by God, by the God of surprises, the Spirit. Within the law, within the certitude of what we know, and not of what we still need to learn and to achieve. What he's saying is, when you read it, because the English translation of his, I can't remember what he is now, but whatever nationality he is, isn't quite clear. But when you read the full article, he's basically saying that the people who stick to the Bible are the people who are saying no to female bishops, for example. They need to be surprised by God. Let the Spirit, let God talk to them now, because God changes his mind. Now, I find that really difficult to accept. Bear in mind that if God is a God of love and mercy and compassion, would he really change his mind? So if, for example, years ago, uh, it was something was wrong and punishable by being stoned to death, how can it now be right and people be allowed to live? How can it be that something that was wrong before and was punished for now isn't? Because that's what they say. They're saying that society has changed and moved on, and because society has moved on, then people need to move on and leave the Bible and move on to something different. But that, to me, goes against everything we know about God being a fair and justifiable God. The head of the Church of England, Justin Wilber, he says this, in a similar situation, actually, there is a great fear among some, here and around the world, that that will lead to the betrayal of our traditions, to the that is the acceptance of the things we talked about, to the denial of the authority of Scripture, to apostasy, not to use too strong a word, and there's also great fear that our decisions will lead us to the rejection of LGBT people, to irrelevance and a changing society, to behaviour that may seem akin to racism. But those fears are alive and well in this room today. We have to find a way forward that is one of holiness and obedience to the call of God and enables us to fulfil our purposes. This cannot be done through fear. How we go forward matters deeply, as does where we arrive. Now, he says we need to move on and change our ideas. And what happened with the Church of England is that those bishops who voted against those issues found themselves retiring and leaving, and then others came in who agreed. So now it's been passed. And I suspect that the, the Catholic Church will do the same. But I'm not criticising them. It's the principle of how they're making the decisions. They're not using the scripture anymore. They're not using the Bible anymore. They're saying we don't need to. Society has changed and we need to move with society. Reclaiming the Bible for Non-Religious World was written by another uh, well-known Church of England character. He wrote this, I do not think for one moment that the Bible is any literal sense the Word of God. It goes on to say, it's a collection of tribal stories that sprang from the experience of human beings seeking to make sense out of the life they're living and the things they're experiencing. So, for a book that says it claims to be the inspired Word of God, for a book that says it was breathed by prophets as they were moved by the Spirit of God, I find it odd that three leading people in, the, in Christianity actually don't treat it in that way. But he specifically says it's not the Word of God. And I find that a bit worrying. Well, quite a lot worrying. So you might say, well, why do I then believe the Bible? Now, there are a number of things you could look at. And I'm putting this up because if you know somebody who you want to talk to about this, you might find a different area, different things to use to the ones I'm going to show you. You could, for example, go to archaeology, if the person's interested in archaeology. 
Um, for centuries they said Babylon didn't exist. They can now go to a site, if it's safe, and see that Babylon did exist. Lots of things in the British Museum prove that the Bible record is accurate. Um, you could turn to history and see how the history has been proven right. Um, for example, sticking with Daniel, uh, Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar, people said didn't exist, um, only in, uh, in Victorian times, and then we find evidence and then now accept it. Uh, the Bible makes prophecy predictions, and we'll look at a couple of those in a minute. Um, science, we'll see some of that. And, and one for me is the, the honesty of the Bible is that if you were writing a book um, that was talking about characters and you wanted to tell their history, a lot of historians would change what they wrote. Herodotus, for example, would put nice things down about people they liked. But in the Bible, it's all quite honest and open. Okay, I'm not sure how this is going to get down, so I hope nobody's offended by this next slide. Um, young people, and myself included in that, might be aware that there is a very popular TV programme called The Big Bang Theory. Now, that Big Bang Theory has a soundtrack, which for me summarises where the world is in terms of all the things we've looked at. So, let's just look at that for a minute. That series assumes that everybody accepts the Big Bang, and very often in episodes there are uh, there is a religious person in it who believes in Jesus, and they make fun of that side of it, but they push on the Big Bang. Now, you probably couldn't get all the lyrics on that, but actually if you listen to some of them, it's quite amazing, because part of the Big Bang theory says that the stars and planets were created in a very short space of time, possibly a day, which is exactly what the Genesis record says, but we don't hear much of that from the scientists. So... If the world then, if, if that's what we are being brought up to believe and it's being accepted in everything, that really there was a big bang and the Bible is just a book of uh, scattered old stories that don't really mean much and even the uh, religious leaders are saying that the Bible is not that important and central to our lives, how can we challenge that back? Because I would say in here that with the greatest respect there isn't any of us who could really take on uh, Richard Dawkins or Stephen Hawking in, on a scientific basis to say you're wrong. That, I think they are, but it would be difficult to do that, and I know some people who have tried. But there may be other ways of doing it. Now, some of you may have seen some of these things. I hope nobody's seen all of them. Otherwise, um, I'll be accused of uh, hashing old material. Um, but there's this. Now, at school, um, I put it there now because this is falling apart, but the Open University did something to celebrate Charles Darwin's 200th, whatever it was, anniversary. That is what they call the Tree of Life. And that's the origin of life coming on the Earth. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're a creation scientist, scientist or an evolution scientist, any scientist. They all agree that that's the order that life came. Water, light, dry land and seas, grass, trees, marine. I just picked those things out. But those are the things that they would agree that's the right order. Now, when we read Genesis chapter 1, you'll notice 
that that's the same order there. Right. OK, so I'm going to look at the young people near the front, behind Stuart. So, so anybody down there, can you tell me... I've got six events. I'm going to call them A, B, C. So imagine I've got six cards, six letters, and I want to pick them up in that order. What's the probability that I'm going to get them in that order? One more. Okay, so I throw them on the floor. What's the probability that I pick them up? You know really you just want to say. Okay. Well, what we do is you go with the first one. You say, right, there are six letters. So the probability of me picking up a letter A is one in six. That means the A's gone. So now to pick up the B is one in five, and so on. One in four. I've just got D, E, F, E, F, and then get that. And that works out to 1 over what's called 1 over 6 factorial, which is 1 over 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 720. So what that's saying is, is I could pick up those six letters off the floor, and there are 720 ways, you knew that, didn't you? I knew you did. 720 ways in putting those six letters on the floor. Okay, 720 different ways. So the probability that I get it right first time is 1 in 720. Okay, so here's the thing. You've just read Genesis chapter 1. How many different versions of Genesis chapter 1 do you know are in the world? And the answer is one. There are no other versions of Genesis chapter 1. Maybe slightly different in translation, but there is only the one. So whoever wrote Genesis chapter 1, let's say it was Moses or not, whoever wrote it, they only wrote one version and got it right first time. And yet, only recently do scientists know that that is the correct order for those six days. Whether they call them days or just events on the earth doesn't really matter for this argument. The logic is that Moses, or whoever, would have had to have written 720 versions of Genesis chapter 1 with the six days in all the different orders in order to guarantee that one was right. And then those 720 would have to keep going until eventually we knew which one was right and we could get rid of it. So how did he know which was the right version? So we don't need a scientist now, we just need to know. The probability is 1720. How did he do it? And if you're interested in that, or the person you're speaking to is interested, then I would recommend this book called The Genesis Enigma. Because in here, a scientist called Andrew Morton, I think, Andrew Parker even, uh, Andrew Parker has written this book in which he shows that those events in Genesis are in the right order. That the green stuff had to come before uh, some of the other life forms. That marine life was on the earth before life was anywhere else. Life began in the seas, just as it says in Genesis, and then it went to the earth. But it began in the water. How did he know that? Why couldn't he have thought, well, actually, life began on earth, and then they went into the seas? How did that person know? Now, what Andrew Parker does is he's not religious either, doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe the Bible's inspired. He's a scientist. But a scientist who says it's an enigma, how he could do it. Now, what he does is he says that Moses didn't write it, it was somebody later. But he even shows that however late you go, you still won't get to a time where a scientist or a person would know the kind of information you need to get that right order right. So, there's the first challenge there. On Genesis chapter 1, science says that's the order life appeared. If you really wanted to get clever, there are 14 things you could pick instead of the six days, and you could do 1 over 14 factorial, which is 1 in 37 billion. But I think 1 in 6 kind of is a strong enough argument. Let's take a second one. This is a video that uh, all these videos you can get on YouTube. Uh, you just type in the phrase that we're looking for. Um, this is um, a picture of the Earth. And this is showing the, the top of the Earth with all the ice that's up there and the water. Now, something called the hydrological cycle. And what this is, is this says that um, basically the seas evaporate under the sun into clouds. The clouds go across over land. As they hit mountains, they start to bring down rain. Rain runs down the mountains in the form of brooks, into rivers, into lakes, and that runs into the sea. And then the whole cycle begins again. It's called the hydrological cycle. It was discovered by Marcus Aurelius in Roman times. Just come to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1.
verse 6. Verse 6 says, The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about up unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers came, thither they return again. Now, this video also shows um, winds around the earth, because winds, there are some called set winds, which are known as trade winds, which were used by ships in the old days to travel around the globe. How then did Solomon know about those? So Solomon knew that there were set winds around the earth, and he knew that the water in the rivers that goes to the sea returns back to the top of the river. How did he know that? He wasn't a scientist. He, he didn't have access to the stuff that Marcus Aurelius and other people had in Roman times. How did Solomon know that the winds had their thick circuits and that the hydrological cycle existed? How did he know that? You see, there's hurricane seasons. There's lots of things that are predictable with the wind that we know are going to happen. And then there's the stuff under the sea, the winds under the sea. They also have their fixed roots every, every year at set times. If you go to the bottom of the ocean, there is a video there. The bottom of the ocean is very dark at the bottom of the ocean. Um, these are um, springs at the very bottom of the ocean. It's actually fresh water springs that come up into the bottom of the seas. That's quite incredible, really, because if we turned to the book of Job, Job chapter 36, Sorry, I can't see the verse at the moment. I'll come back. I will come back to that. Job 36 actually says in verse 27, He maketh small the drops of water, they pour down rain according to the vapour thereof, which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. And he goes on to talk about the spreading of the clouds. Um, can't see the verse at the moment. There is a verse, and we'll look at it in a minute perhaps, uh, that tells you that Job talks about springs at the bottom of the ocean. Now, Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible. And uh, you don't need me to tell you that Job didn't have a submarine. So how did Job know that at the bottom of the oceans there were underwater currents? Sorry, anybody who knows me knows I'm a perfectionist. I don't like to keep my things go wrong. So I think it's Job 38. Yes. Job 38, verse 16. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? So how did Job know there were springs in the sea? Because as I said, he wouldn't have known that because he couldn't get down to the deep. Um, that was filmed in 2005. Um, it was only just around about the year 2000 that they managed to get cameras to go so low. Um, men went down there, but because it's so deep, it was difficult to get down to. So it took a long time for those to be discovered. And people would say the discovery took place in the late 1990s early 2000s. So how did Job know there were springs at the bottom of the ocean? And in fact Job is a scientist in a sense because remember Stephen Fry said the scientists have proved a lot of things that kind of prove the Bible wrong but actually it's the other way around. Job said, these are all Job quotes but other people say it as well, Job said and Isaiah did that the earth was round. Now I know the Flat Earth Society still exists but most of us know the earth is round um, it, we've seen it, we've seen images of it. How did Job know that And Isaiah? Job says the earth is suspended, it's on nothing. Now, in the early days, they used to think it was on the back of a giant tortoise or some other creature. So how did Job know the earth was suspended on nothing, just in the air? Job says that light has motion, it can move. Scientists only discovered that in the 1900s. Job says that light is a spectrum, he says light can be divided. On that basis, Sir Isaac Newton then had a look at light 
and showed you could create a prism and showed that light was made up of the different colours. He did that because he believed the Bible to be true. But Job, how did Job know? Because no one knew before Isaac Newton that it was true. How did Job know that you could divide light? In Job 8 he talks about photosynthesis, this idea of the green stuff giving off oxygen uh, and putting oxygen into the air. That plant life wouldn't live without that. He talks about it, shooting forth the green stuff. Job says that air has weight. Again, scientists, people said it didn't until the late 1900s. Cloud has mass. And then animal instincts, there's a whole chapter, Job chapter 39. It talks about animal instincts, the instincts that animals have, their natural instincts, like the ostrich. And yet some of those animals Job wouldn't know, wouldn't have seen. How did Job know all of those things? And, and there's lots more, but I'll just pick a few out. Uh, he talks about sonar waves and solar waves, for example. How did Job know about those things then? Okay, here's a human body. Well, some of the human body. Somebody, can somebody explain to me um, what's man made up of? What chemicals, roughly speaking? Okay. It's mostly water, isn't it? We made mostly. That's my excuse for being overweight. It's mostly water. I drink a lot of water. And so it's mostly water and things, the elements that you would find in the ground, in the earth. Now it's interesting, isn't it? Because for years, lots of people, and some religions still do, say that human beings are made of something unique. There's nothing like it on earth. But actually, that's not true. And the Genesis record went on to say, if we carry on with chapter 2, to tell us that man was made of the dust of the ground, that God added water, a mist, and he made and fashioned man. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We now know, although no one knew for, until the 19th century how it worked, that the human being has a heart which pumps blood around the water. And that blood carries oxygen around the body to give it life. The scriptures constantly speak about life being in the <coughs> blood. And it's true, the, the blood carries the oxygen around. Without that, we would not live. How did Moses mentions this in the law. How did he know that life was in the blood? How did he know that when he couldn't see inside a man? Unless, of course, he was told. Okay. The law of circumcision that Moses introduced as, as part of the law, but was put back there in the days of Abraham, says that on the eighth day, a male child was to be circumcised. Okay, so if you were going to deliberately cut someone, yeah, an incision, whatever it might be, cut someone, when is the best time to do that? Now, I remember as a young person being told by a sister that on the eighth day, vitamin K has been produced. And vitamin K is the blood clotting agent, and that is true. So, if you wanted to cut somebody deliberately, which is what the law of circumcision was about, you would choose the eighth day. It was the earliest day you could do it, because days five, six, and seven were when this vitamin K was being produced. And by day eight, it would be produced. How did Moses know that? I'm pretty certain Moses didn't go, well, let's try with one day old, let's try a two year old day old, until he got to eight and thought, oh, eight days survives, we'll do eight then. How did he know? Now, I thought that was quite remarkable until um, I looked into it a bit further. Uh, I've got a friend who's an expert on blood, um, and he's not a vampire, but he's a, he's a scientist. Um, but he, he told me about blood because there's something else. See, if you're going to deliberately cut someone, there's something else you'd want to make sure of. And that is that the immune system is good. And there is a time in a human life when the immune system is at its maximum. So most of the time it runs at 100% once you've been born a few days. It runs at 100%. But there is one day, one day only, in the whole life of a human being when that immune system goes up to 110, a little bit higher percent. And that's day eight. So if you were going to deliberately cut someone, the best time to do it is when the immune system is at its highest possible and that the clotting agent is there as a, as a, an, I was going to say as a dead cert, as, as an important thing. So how did Moses know that? Because that was only discovered recently. How did Moses know that day eight was definitely the right day? Because he didn't have that knowledge, he didn't have that science to back it up. Unless, of course, God told him. Okay, 
I don't know if anybody wants to say that word. I have no intention of saying it. Uh, I'm just going to say DNA because that's a lot easier. And you might say, well, how does DNA prove the Bible true? Um, we're made from the dust of the earth. And dust thou art, unto dust shalt thou return, is what the record says. Men didn't accept that. For centuries, man hasn't accepted that. Um, I've seen articles and commentaries, old books, um, where people have argued that there has to be an immortal soul because once the body starts to corrupt, God can't do anything with that. He has to use the soul, something that's alive, because he can't do it. Yet the Bible says that he can, of the very dust of the earth, create seed onto Abraham, for example. Now we know, and I suspect there's people in this room who've never known any different, but we all have unique DNA. And that from a little bit of DNA, you can actually predict how long that person will live, what that person did, etc., and who that person is. Now, resurrection, the idea that God can raise someone from the dead is fantastic. I'm not belittling it. But how much easier is it for God that he just takes a bit of DNA and can create the whole person? And Moses and people who wrote about resurrection and who wrote about these things knew that man could be raised in just a little bit of dust of the earth. And the whole character can be reassembled, can be remade. I'm going to throw in a health warning here, is that if you go on the internet looking for reasons to believe the Bible is true, please be careful because uh, I'm aware of a, a brother who actually has done a similar thing to this, but he then gave one here, which I'll tell you just to show you how you need to be careful, is that um, I think it was the Harvard Business School and the Yale Business School, two in America and one over here, very important universities, had on their website a discovery from DNA. Um, when DNA is created, you'll be aware that in the DNA there is something called junk code. Yeah? And in that junk code, it's in everybody's, but nobody knows what that junk code is. And this scientist, very well-known scientist, to put a paper together looking at that DNA and looking at the junk code. And what he found was that in the junk code there are about 26, 27 characters that are different to the rest of the coding. So it worked along the lines of, what if, because it seems, seems a a possibility that languages have around about that many characters. What if this was written in a language and was a secret code? So he ran alongside six, seven thousand languages on a computer program, the junk code. And he found that when you do that, the junk code matched a language and made sense. And the language that he matched was Hebrew. And he then showed that within the junk code, the phrase Yahweh occurred and another phrase, the Lord is one. Now, that was on websites for a good 12, 18 months, and people were using that to prove the Bible was inspired, until it was proved it was a hoax, and not true. All the ones I've shown you so far are true, they're scientifically proven, um, so just be careful if you go on the internet and try and prove something, because obviously the person he told now doesn't believe him, because he believed a hoax. So, lots of science things there. So, days of creation, the order in which it occurred, how did they get that right? Lots of bits of scientific knowledge that we've only known recently. For me though, one of the biggest things that make me believe the Bible is prophecy. In the book of Ezekiel there's a prophecy about the nation of Israel. Israel were going to be scattered throughout all nations of the world and then brought back. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the voice of the Lord. I will make breath into you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. 
Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath and say to it, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. So Ezekiel said that despite the fact that Israel would be scattered through all nations of the world, they would at the time of the end be brought back to their land. Now, again, many in this room, uh, including myself, have only ever known Israel in their land. But before 1948, they weren't. Uh, and if you go into, you can Google it, if you look in history books, you'll find that the history of Israel, that they weren't even going to go back to Israel, they were offered other lands. But in the end, they ended up exactly as Ezekiel said, back in the land of Israel. Golda Meir, one of their leaders, said that this nation, as small as it is, surrounded as it is by his enemies, has decided to live, almost in the spirit of Ezekiel 37. So one of the other reasons, I believe, is not just those scientific bits, but the fact that God predicted what would happen to Israel all through their history, and you could go through all their history. He made constant predictions about what would happen, it would be divided, about its kings, about them being scattered throughout the world, and then being brought back, and brought back to the land of Israel. <coughs> and then I guess for me the one that really clinches it is this one now again some of you may have seen it I don't think the end ones will have done this is a really easy quiz and I'll tell you when we see why we do it in a minute so in which country was Jesus born Israel, Egypt or the United States anybody want to shout out an answer it's true. yeah Israel thank you in which tribe was Jesus born? Le uh, sorry, yeah. In which tribe was Jesus born? Levi, Judah, or Reuben? Judah. Judah. In which, to which family was Jesus born? The family of David, Eliab, or Shammah? David. Where was Jesus born? Nazareth, Jerusalem, Bethlehem? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. <laughs> How did the Jews treat, Jews treat Jesus? They loved him, they despised him, or they made him king? Despised. despised him. On which animal did Jesus ride? A horse, an ass, or a lion? Where did Jesus die? Nazareth, Jerusalem, or Bethlehem? How did, who did Jesus die with? Wicked men, his followers, or no one? Yeah, wicked men. I saw your lips move, so I'm counting that. <laughs> who buried Jesus? The government? King Herod, or a rich man? Rich man, and finally for 10 out of 10, how did Jesus die? Stoning, crucifixion, or poison? Crucifixion. Crucifixion, okay, thank you, congratulations, 10 out of 10. Okay, so how do we know those answers are correct, apart from they're clever? It's because we can read in the Bible about them, and there are the passages that prove those points. But you'll notice that all of those passages occur in the Old Testament, before Jesus was born. So how did David, Isaiah, Micah and Zechariah know those ten things before Jesus was born. And if someone doubts that, then just ask them to go to Jerusalem, to go to a place called the Shrine of the Book, where they can see originals of those manuscripts that are dated pre-100 BC, so at least 100 years before Jesus was even born. And let me show you why that's amazing to me. If you were asked where Jesus was born, if you asked Joseph and Mary, a few months before, I'm sure they would have said Nazareth, because that's where they were. And then a decree comes and they end up going to Bethlehem. Two years, or 18 months, two years after Jesus had been born, the wise men thought Jer Jesus had been born in Jerusalem, the city of kings. So it's amazing, isn't it, that Micah got it spot on when he said the little town of Bethlehem was going to be the place where Jesus would be born. Even though months before it looked as though it was going to be Nazareth, and a couple of years later it looked as though it should have been Jerusalem, but actually Micah had said Bethlehem. How did Jesus die? Well, if you knew he was going to die, then in David's time, which was a thousand years BC when he wrote Psalm 22, where it tells us he would be, his hands and feet would be pierced, is you would have said stoning, because that was a logical thing for blasphemy. Someone was accused of blasphemy, you stone them to death. Or run through with a sword, maybe. But crucifixion wasn't really known. Here's something else, and I've done this before, but I'll do it again because I think this is quite a powerful lesson. If I asked you, how am I going to die? 
without being morbid. Um, you might say, well, because I am accident pro, um, in the last 12 months um, I've had four accidents. Um, one where I, I don't know why I laughed then, but I did. <laughs> one where I actually didn't need to die and had seizures and stuff because I fell badly. S having got over that, I got, got hit by a woman who reversed off a drive. And then having got over that, I got hit by a car and was over crossing. And then I fell down a manhole while I was running through leaves. So I am quite accident prone, that's just 12 months of running, pays to keep fit. So you could say accident is accident prone, so that's how you'll die. Or you could say diabetic because I've got problems with um, insulin levels and stuff. If I was to say what will happen to the clothes I'm wearing when I die, you might, if you know Jackie, you'll say Oxfam. Unless I've been running, in which case you just chuck them in the bin. So you might guess and second guess that. So when you get a moment, a quiet moment, just read Psalm 22. Because in Psalm 22, a thousand years before Jesus was even born, David said that he would die with his feet and hands being pierced. And that he would be wearing one garment for which they would cast lots. And the rest of his garments would be torn up into bits and people would have bits of garment. How could he possibly know that? How could David possibly have known that? And we know, because there's a copy of that in the shrine of the book in Jerusalem, we know that was written at least 100 years before Jesus was even born. How could he possibly know? And I could go on, but I'm not going to, as to why I believe the Bible to be true. It's not there because we can predict the future. But we can. We can say that Jesus is going to come back to the earth very soon. We can say there's going to be a worldwide kingdom on the earth because the Bible tells us that. And we can trust that because of all the things we've looked at and more that suggest the Bible is really a fantastic book, an inspired book. But the most important thing is that that book actually can change our lives. When we sing the final hymn, <coughs> It's become a favourite of mine because, for me, the Bible isn't meant to be this thing that we use to, to hit people with or to bash people. Uh, it's not there to predict the future of what's going to happen in Russia or in Germany. It's not there for those things at all. The Bible is there to tell us what God's mind is, what God wants from us, what God wants on this earth, why God made this earth in the very first place, why he made human beings and what he wants out of us. It's a book that tells us everything we need to know in terms of what doctrines we need to believe. It's a book that tells us how we should lead our lives, what we need to change, what we need to do differently, how we need to please God. It's a book that's full of love and tells us of his love for us. It's a book that tells us of a man, his son, who, having been perfect and led a perfect life, laid down his life. So that people like you and people like me might turn and understand the gospel message. That's why I believe the Bible. I'd like to know why you believe the Bible. So tell me afterwards if you want. But most importantly, let's just realise that this book that we have in our laps, it's the most valuable book in the world. It's the most precious book in the world. Not because it's just because it's got all that information in it, but because that book was written by God. Thank you for listening.